Let's consider shear stress in beams. Calculating shear stress itself is actually fairly straightforward. I mean, if moments cause bending stress, then shear causes shear stress. And those are the really only two types of stress we're interested in beams, or at least they're the two major types. So the equation is pretty easy. It's the shear stress tau is equal to the shear load itself, V, times an area property Q, which is actually the first moment of area, divided by I, which is the moment of inertia, or the second moment of area, and divided by T, the thickness of the beam. And I'll show you what all these things mean in a moment. But calculating it is pretty easy if you have all these things. I mean, we always make shear and moment diagrams for beams. So reading the, the shear at any point is pretty easy. You just look at the shear diagram and you can find V. But Q and I are area properties. I is pretty straightforward. We've seen how to calculate it. It's the second moment of area, and usually we end up looking it up in tables and using the parallel axis theorem, and, but we can come up with I. T is just a thickness, it's just a geometry of the beam, but Q is sort of the sticking point. That's the, it's not really all that hard, but you have to get used to it. And the reason you have to get used to it is because it varies. Whereas I is a number that is constant, once you've calculated for the cross-sectional area, you're done, it's, it's easy. Q actually depends on exactly where you'd like to compute the stress. So you might have looked at that equation and said, well, if Q is an area property and I is an area property, isn't there some way we can just put those two together and call it something else in the equation be done? We can't, and the reason we can't is because Q depends on exactly at what line you want to calculate the shear stress itself. So it is an area property that varies because there's, there's a portion of the area that we need to consider, and it's a portion that is away from the neutral axis uh, where we want to compute the stress. So imagine that you have just a simple rectangle and you want to compute the stress at some distance from the centroid. Well, you're interested in all the area beyond that particular line. And so Y bar is the distance from the centroid of the overall shape to the centroid of that area that is beyond the, the line where you'd like to compute the stress. And this gets kind of confusing for a while until you consider this figure for a while. Here's that rectangular beam I mentioned. Let's consider uh, the beam fairly simply. Let's say we're interested in the shear stress along the center line. So pretty simple. So the center line is actually coincident with the uh, centroid of the overall area in this case. And so the what's called the particular area, A sub P, or the, the area that we have to calculate properties for, that area is the area beyond the line where we want the stress going away from the neutral axis. Again, since the neutral axis in item B is the same as the line where we want to compute the stress, then really all we need is the area beyond the centroidal axis. Okay, And then Y bar is the distance between the centroidal axis of the whole shape and the, the centroid of the the particular area, the area you see that's shaded in gray. So that's not too bad. What if we're interested in the stress along line BB, as in item C in the lower left-hand corner? In that case, we need the area beyond that line away from the neutral axis. Now, the neutral axis is line AA. It looks like the A is cut off a little bit there. I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, AA is the centroid uh, line for the whole area, whereas B is the line where we like to get the shear stress. And so the, the particular area, A sub P, is the area beyond line B going away from line AA. And then Y bar is the distance between the centroid of the overall shape and the centroid of that particular area, which is a little higher than it was in figure B. Now if we continue, let's consider line CC, which is farther away from the centroidal axis. Notice the particular area has shrunk. There's less of it, right? We're interested in the area beyond line CC, away from the neutral axis AA, and we need the distance then between the neutral axis of the overall uh, shape and the, the, the centroid of the particular area. Notice Y bar is increasing. 
Now, what if we take that all the way to the extreme where we're interested in the shear stress at DD, which is at the very top of this cross section? Well, in that case, Y bar is at its maximum, but the particular area equals zero. So the value of Q, which is always the particular area multiplied by Y bar, the value of Q is zero because anything times zero is just zero. And the particular area and calculation for Q always work the same way. That was a simple example with just a rectangular beam. If you had a, you know, an I-beam or something like that, you would always be interested in, okay, how much area are we talking about? In other words, draw a line where I want to know the shear stress, all the area beyond that line going away from the central axis, that's the particular area. I need the centroid of that area, and I need the centroid of the overall area so I can get Y bar, the distance between the two. And once I've got those two things, I can multiply them together, and I've got Q, the first moment of area, for that particular line. So one thing we can learn from the, well, four things we can learn from this, actually, is that uh, the max shear uh, is at the centroid of the overall shape if the thickness there is no greater than at some other axis. If you think of an I-beam, the centroid of the I-beam is right in the center of it, right? And at that point, the thickness is the width of the web, okay? As you move out farther and farther and you approach the flange and say you get to the flange, then the thickness becomes the width of the flange. That's a much higher thickness T. But near the, the center of that uh, I-beam, the thickness is smallest and so the maximum shear occurs typically where the thickness is the smallest and at the center because that's the point where uh, you know you got VQ over IT so Q is the largest typically in the center and then if the thickness is the smallest then you've got over T and that again uh, makes the the tall the shear stress large if the thickness is constant, in other words, the figure I just showed was a simple rectangle. That has a constant thickness along the entire height. In that case, the shear stress distribution will simply be a parabola. So it'll be maximum in the center, zero at either edge, uh, as I noted in the last uh, point here. But it will be maximum in the center, and the overall shape is parabolic. Now, when the thickness changes abruptly, so does the shear stress, because remember the shear stress, tau, is equal to VQ over IT. So that over T, if the thickness changes abruptly, as it does in an I-beam, right? When you go from the web to the flange, the thickness goes from, you know, whatever the width of the web is, or the thickness of the web, all the way to the width of the flange. That's a sudden change. And so that's a sudden increase in thickness, and therefore a sudden decrease in shear stress. So here's an image of a simple... Uh, rectangular beam with a parabolic stress distribution maximum in the center at the neutral axis and minimum at the outer edges. Here's an I-beam. So the upper left figure is an I-beam and you notice that the shear stress distribution almost looks parabolic except where there's a sudden change in the thickness. Right? We go from the web where there's a very small thickness. Remember it's in the denominator VQ over IT. That thickness T is in the denominator. And so uh, in the, the, the center section, the web, the shear stress is high. But when you get out to the flange, you've got a very large width. You've got a very large thickness, T. And so the shear stress drops accordingly. And, of course, it drops off to zero at the upper and lower fiber of the I-beam. Now, what if we sort of inverted this? What if we had a cross shape? What would that look like? Well, again, the this, this shear stress is typically going to be maximum wherever the, the thinnest section of the shape is located and so that's not in the center anymore. We've taken the web and sort of reversed it. This wouldn't make a very good beam at all. But um, anyway, the you notice that the shear stress jumps all of a sudden when we move from the wide section in the center to the narrow section at the top or at the bottom. What about a T-shaped beam? Well, we can see the same sort of behavior here where we essentially have a parabolic distribution in the web uh, there's no lower flange and as we move you know and the thickness goes from the thickness of the web to the thickness of the flange which TF is much larger than TW the the shear stress drops abu abruptly and, and uh, significantly and of course we still have zero shear stress at either end even though the web is fairly thin remember there's no particular area beyond the last line in the web at the bottom therefore Q is equal to zero and therefore the shear stress is equal to zero
There are some special formulas. It's not always convenient to use VQ over IT for everything. And calculating Q can be a pain. Having to calculate I can be a pain. And if you're just talking about a rectangle or a circle or some other shape, most of the time what you really want is the maximum shear stress. You realize it's zero at the outer edges. And all you really care about is the maximum shear stress. In the case of a rectangle, it's easier to calculate the maximum shear stress as simply 3V over 2A, where 3 over 2 are just numbers. V is the shear stress, and A is the total cross-sectional area of the rectangle, which would be base times height. In the case of a circular cross-section, the maximum shear occurs along the center line, just as it would along the center line of the rectangle, but then it's four-thirds V over A, where again V is the shear load, and A is the cross-sectional area, which would be pi D squared over four, or pi R squared, whichever one is most convenient. For a thin-walled tube, in other words, a tube where the, the diameter dimension is much, much larger than the thickness dimension of the tube, in that case, the approximate maximum stress is 2V over A and, again, occurs along the center line of that tube. Now, it says approximate here because it's an approximation where that, the thickness of the wall tube approaches zero. So this is approximate. The real tube is going to be a little bit different, but this is reasonable for most, uh, most cases. And for thin webbed shapes, the maximum stress is simply V over A, where A is the area of the web. And we'll see more of this in the example problems. How much shear should material be uh, subjected to? Well, there is a table in your book, table 3-4, that shows the design stress guidelines for shear. I realize we're not in, in chapter 3 at this point, but it's the same table because we're still talking about shear stress. And so you should have the page in the back of the book I've referenced many times marked. This is in the back of the book. And these are simply the, the shear stresses that we typically would use for materials. This is no different from what we were doing before. It's just shear stress. However, if we're using a standard steel shape like an I-beam or you know a, a T-shape or an, uh, an angle bracket, something like that, then we should use a design stress of about 40% of the yield strength. That's more of a, an AISC recommendation and what we would use in that case. Now, shear flow is another concept. It's something that's really important. Have you ever thought about building an I-beam out of wood or a T-beam out of wood? And you realize, well, you know, that web has to trans, you know, it has to, it has to contact the flange very well, right? There, there has to be some solid connection between those two. And you might consider just putting nails in it. I, I bought a bed uh, a while back, probably 10 years ago now. I finally bought myself a nice bed. And I like to have a large bed so I can spread out. And, you know, if I get hot at night, I can throw off the covers and, you know, have plenty of room to move around. I used to move more in my sleep. I don't so much anymore. But I bought this nice bed. And it's a large bed, and so it, it's a king size. It's got a mattress that's one uh, mattress, but the lower uh, box springs is actually two separate uh, uh, sections. And so you imagine these two box springs sit side by side. Well, they, they can tend to just simply give in the center. And so you, you put wood underneath it, essentially. But if you just put flat wood slats, and that's what came with the bed, they're really not all that stiff. And, you know, the, the, the mattresses still tend to bow in, and then the, the mattress on top, or the box springs bow in, and the mattress then bows in the center. It's a big pain when you've paid a decent amount of money for a, a good mattress, or at least a decent mattress, and a, a decent bed. So what I did is I took the slats that came with the bed. They were oh probably two three inches wide something like that and I had some old pieces of wood that I didn't need anymore that were uh, I think they were probably about eight inches wide something like that three quarter inch thick and they ran the width of the bed and I simply built my own eye beams out of it and it's worked great ever since then my bed doesn't sag I like being an engineer because I can do these things well here's a question how many screws do I need to put in between the upper flange and that, that web, essentially, and of course on the lower side too, how many screws do I need? Or if I glue it, you know, what should the strength of the glue be at that interface? In order to consider this, we need to think about, well, basically our question is shear flow. It has to do with shear flow. Uh, to understand this, we have to imagine what's going on at a cross-section. So let's just take an example of a T-beam. And 
let's think of a load where we've got some shear V of say 150 kilonewtons. Okay, so you can see the arrow acting down on the face, and of course that shear load is going to generate shear stress. It's going to be you know maximum where it's thin, which is going to be somewhere probably at the the centroid or so of this cross section. Um, the, the shear stress will be fairly low in the flange, but it'll jump all of a sudden, right, as we move from the flange down to the web. And it'll be zero at the top and at the bottom. Now, if there is shear on that face, if there is shear stress on that face, if you think about extracting a cube out of it and just looking at it, the right-hand side of this cube that I've drawn represents the shear stress on the face that we can see. But to hold that cube in equilibrium, we have to have an equal and opposite shear stress on the other side. That takes care of the force equilibrium. But now the whole cube wants to turn. So we've got to have shear stress at the top and bottom in order to maintain the, the moment on the cube, right? So the cube doesn't rotate. So this cube will deform. It will, will shear, right? There will be shear strain. But the, the point of all this is if we think about that interface between the web and the flange, there's shear stress there. And that should make sense to you. If, you. if I just laid the flange on top of the beam and then I loaded it, it'd be pretty easy for that flange to slide around. And I don't want that. That's the whole reason for putting screws in to connect it together or gluing the two together so that I have a good rigid connection. Actually, it turns out I got into my bed one night, and I guess I didn't do as good a job as I should have with all the screws and things, and one of my I-beams actually broke. Uh, so I took the bed apart, of course, uh, I think for that the night, since I was tired, I just you know put a support underneath it and you know worried about it the next day. But I looked at it and I realized, oh, I guess I, I should have done this calculation that I'm about to show you because I didn't have enough screws in it to hold it all together. So I actually took it apart and put some glue on it this time and screwed it back together with more screws, and it's been fine ever since. But how do you answer the question of how much connection you need or what kind of shear stress should it be able to withstand? Or how many fasteners do you need? Well, we're going to start by realizing we can calculate the stress, the shear stress on the front face as VQ over IT. And then that's the same stress on all sides of the cube in order to hold the cube in equilibrium. So we can actually calculate the shear stress at the interface between the flange and the web pretty easily of this uh, T-shaped beam. So here you see a picture of it. You see the sudden abrupt change. Of course, what we're going to use is use the higher stress just before the transition, uh, but we can calculate fair, that fairly easily. But the, the VQ over IT is the part we're going to call shear flow because understand we're interested in the shear stress just at that interface. Okay, So if we put that all together, then VQ over IT I, uh, VQ over I, I'm sorry, you used to saying VQ over IT. VQ over I is what we define as little q, which is called the shear flow. And then rearranging things just a little bit, you would realize that that's equal to the shear stress times the thickness. And we can actually use this to calculate the minimum spacing of some fasteners to basically distribute that, that shear load uh, amongst all of the fasteners. Now I'm not going to show you the details of this right now. I'll show you how to use this in the context of an example problem because there's more to think about here. But it's important that you realize shear flow, little q, is just VQ over I so that if we rearrange the equation uh, it's equal to shear stress times the thickness of the, the cross-section. 